Thank you all so much for coming to the parking pricing session. Ah, great. How are things going? Um, good. I mean, I think um, I am Lisa Jacobson. I'm a senior associate at Nelson Nygaard. Um, and, and thank you again. Uh, spending all day in, in a windowless room talking about parking uh, is always a lot of fun. And you heard a lot about pricing in the first session. And I think this is going to build off it quite nicely. Uh, so we have three great speakers today. I'm going to introduce them all at once at the beginning, and then we can we can roll through the presentations, then have some questions at the end. Uh, the first is our mayor of Haverhill, Mayor, mayor Fiorentini. He's been the mayor of Haverhill since January 2004, which makes him the longest serving mayor in the city of Haverhill. Prior to being mayor, Mayor Fiorentini was city councilor in Haverhill and also served as the assistant district attorney in Essex County as a special assistant attorney general and was in the private practice for law for over 25 years. When Mayor Fiorentini took office, he instituted a plan to rezone downtown Haverhill for mixed use and aggressively sought Brownfields funding in order to assess and clean up polluted factory sites. He has succeeded in, building, in bringing 1.8 million in Brownfields funding to the city and in attracting national developers to convert abandoned factory buildings into mixed-use housing and retail. Uh, Mayor is going to talk today about uh, the political challenges and also successes in Haverhill. Next will come Mark Chase. Uh, Mark has 20 years of planning, transportation planning experience in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Notably, he helped to launch the car sharing service Zipcar. He has directed two nonprofit advocacy organizations and was a regional transportation planner for MAPC. Mark also maintains parkingreform.org, a great website covering best practices in parking management, and he also teaches uh, transportation planning at Tufts and at Harvard. Last but not least, Salvador Pina. Uh, Sal has been in the public sector for 35 years, uh, including working for Massachusetts departments of mental retardation, mental health, and employment and training, and in several municipalities in the South Shore, including Taunton, Fall River, Brockton, Attleboro, and currently Wareham. He is currently the uh, director of Wareham's Community and Economic Development Authority, and he's on the board of directors for the Northeast Economic Development Association. Uh, so thank you to our panelists for being here. And Mayor, we'll start with you. Should I speak from up there? That's back to you. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. And I'd like to talk to you about the political aspects of pay for parking. Long time ago, we had a uh, consultant for parking. His name was Larry Berman. He's retired now down in Florida. And he said there's really two aspects for parking, uh, the technical aspect and the political aspect. And I want to talk to you about the, the political aspect today. Let me tell you first about the city of Havel, if I can figure out how to use these things. There we go. We're 35 miles north of Boston, a city of 61,000 people. And we really have two completely different sections of our downtown. And that's part of our challenge. The old retail section is to the east, and there for decades led the opposition to pay for parking. And to the west uh, is a new restaurant and factories on that, that bullet down there should say say, uh, to the west. The east, they're completely different zones. The east is mostly vacant at night. They have a lot of office workers during the day. And the west is restaurants, which are mostly open uh, during, the, uh, during the nighttime. The opposition to pay for parking has gone on. There we go. For many, many decades, it's 35 years of debate. We installed parking meters, as many communities did in the 40s or 50s. They were removed in the 1970s. My, all four of my grandparents ran downtown businesses. And then we instituted or tried to institute pay for parking in 2004, 2006, 2008. They were all defeated, a long time debate. And you're going to hear about that in a minute. And we finally got pay for parking uh, in, approved in 2012. So it's what I call 35 years of the parking wars. We started in 2004 when I took office. I ran on a platform, believe it or not, part of my platform was to put in pay for parking. It's kind of amazing I got elected. but. <laughs> And we started with an effort to revitalize the west end of town, which at that time was mostly abandoned shoe factories, and there really wasn't much uh, else going on. We did a parking study. We hired a group called Desmond Associates in order to get in a parking garage, and we submitted our first parking plan. The first parking plan included all areas, both east, which you remember is the retail zone, and west, uh, and the plan was defeated. The council thought it was 
too big and encompassed too much and tried to do too much. So we had Larry Berman come in, who was our first consultant, and Larry came up with a different plan, which was only the western area, and that was defeated by the council. They said it was too small. It's too big, it's too small. But the real answer was none of that. The real answer was uh, there was too much opposition in the room, and that's really the key to getting pay for parking um, approved. You've got to keep the opposition out of the room. Now, simu <laughs> no, I'm very serious about that. You'll hear about that. Now, simultaneously, while we were doing that, I was trying to rezone the downtown in order. I wanted to eliminate pay for parking requirement. I'm sorry, uh, parking zoning requirements altogether. In many of our streets, the public had never forgotten the names of these streets. No one had parked on these streets for 35 years, and if residents came in, occupied those buildings, and parked on the streets. What did we care? That was terrific. I couldn't get that through the council, but while the pay for parking was going on, we were trying our best to institute reduced zoning requirements. Uh, we read, uh, at some point, I don't remember when, Professor Shoup's book came out, and it was a big help to us. In 2006, we tried again. I I put in a plan called a parking improvement district. I thought I invented that phrase until I heard read of Professor Shoup and what's going on here. But um, that was only in the western end of downtown. No meters on the eastern end, which is uh, Merrimack Street. We had parking permits that were available. Uh, we would implement it in phases. All money would go to the downtown area. And that was defeated also, uh, largely because there was no buy-in and because there were too much opposition in the room. And that's the key. In 2008 and 2010, a new parking garage, we were able to get a federal earmark before earmarks went away to put in a federal to a parking garage on the western end of town. And that gave us some impetus to try pay for parking again. Um, there was a fear that if we charged, and we had to charge for parking in the garage, that there was no way to maintain it, uh, that if the garage charged and on the street was free, nobody would park in the garage. So we hired an outside consultant. We hired Jason Schreiber. I don't know where Jason is right now, but he did a terrific job for us. And that was really a key to passage. You're never a prophet in your own land, and you need to bring in a consultant. Over the summer of 2012, we had loads and loads of public input in order to get a pay-for-parking plan passed. You cannot have too much input. I don't remember how many hearings we had. I think we had 16 public hearings. And you can't have enough. Even after we did that, we had months and months, years actually, of stories in the newspaper that we were considering pay for parking. When the first meters went in, we got calls from people saying, well, how come no one told us about this? Well, how come there was no notice? And even the postmaster in Havel, whom we'd actually met with and was on our email list, called and said, no one told me. You're putting in meters. My God, you cannot have too many public hearings. Uh, the key for us was to look at the key opposition that had defeated us three times in a row and to keep them out of the room. <laughs> now, the plan we put forward was two different plans, one for each end of downtown. On the east side, the old retail section, that's where the opposition had been for 35 years, with people who had run retail stores, who had worked hard to keep meters out in the 1970s, never liked them when they were put in the 50s. It was often the same people. And uh, we tried our best to keep them out of the room. We didn't succeed completely, but we agreed on the east side, no charge for on-street parking at all. We would charge in the lots. We would have two hours free. We had a parking garage on the east side. We would have two hours free parking on the street and in the space we had a little lot in front of the parking garage, that would be free also. We would have loads of free parking around that area of town where we could get their employees to go. Uh, and uh, we had a group called Pentucket Medical, a big medical provider that was downtown, and uh, we were very worried about their opposition if they brought in 15 elderly patients who objected. Our plan was dead, so we agreed to give them two hours of free parking. And that was a very difficult thing for us, but that is, that's what we did. 
On the west side, where now we had a lot of restaurants and we had a lot of new development that was locating, um, we had a lot more buy-in. So we had a different plan on the west side. That's where the restaurants were. That's where we had a real parking problem, particularly at night. And we agreed that we would, the plan that we put forth was to charge for parking on the streets there, but not on the east side, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Permit parking at $30. I put an hour, don't I wish? <laughs> $30 a month. <laughs> And uh, we sold this to the restaurateurs uh, that it would be free up spaces for their customers. And getting buy-in from the restaurateurs was absolutely key. Uh, we did this all by a map which no one could read or understand. That made it easier to sell to the council. <laughs> We thought we had the votes to finally get this passed after all of those years, uh, but then at the last minute some opposition came in. The first was from the PMA group, I already uh, indicated to them, so we dealt with them to keep them out of the room, that's the key, uh, by giving them two hours of free parking. A number of the businesses came in and said, $30 a month for our employees will kill us. And they had a legitimate point. You always have to listen to people. They said, many of our employees are waitresses. They're very low-wage employees. And charging them, we can't afford to do it. We'll be out of business. If you charge our people $30 a month, you'll kill them. So we agreed to reduce the price to 15 a month. And you'll hear about that in a minute. Um, many of the merchants felt that a dollar an hour would kill them. We reduced the price to 15 to 50 cents an hour, that was a mistake on our part. What we found is that the people who were object to a dollar an hour are going to object to 10 cents an hour. Uh, <laughs> and then we had, just when we thought we had the votes, we were due to have an opposition, um, a local deli came in. And it's a deli where all the political people, including myself, go. And they came in and they started a big Facebook and internet campaign that said, you're charging in front of our place, but you're not charging in the other end of town. This is gonna kill us, we'll be out of business. And they started a campaign called One or All, and um, they lined up a number of city councilors, enough votes to kill us. So we made a number of compromises. We cut the price in half, the two hours free for PMA. Uh, one of the banks came in, they were opposed. We agreed to give them seven free spaces in a lot. They didn't need them, but we gave them to them. Uh, you have to draw the line somewhere. Some of the businesses came in and they wanted to lease parking spaces and we drew the line at that. We made a pledge to fix up downtown. That brought the restaurant uh, owners uh, in. And we made an agreement with the deli that we wouldn't start charging on the street in, front, in their area of town in the western end until 3 p.m. We also agreed, and we didn't have any choice on this, that only the council could set the rates, not the parking commission. We had a long, very boisterous, very difficult series of hearings, and finally we got it through on a six to three uh, uh, vote. It was difficult. Now, parking plans always evolve, always. You're never going to get it right the first time. So we ended up with a number of complaints. One of them was there was a shortage of permit spaces. The employees were complaining. They wanted to park directly in front of their businesses. So we did reverse angled in parking and that freed up a lot of free spaces and that helped us a great deal. We re-examined this in January of 2013 and I'm gonna skim through this because I'm down to a couple of minutes. But uh, what we found was the parking plan worked, but with some difficulties. More people were parking downtown despite all of the complaints we got that nobody would go down. More people were using the MVRTA garage. We did get some favorable comments from merchants. We made a little bit of money on the plan, but not certainly not what we had hoped. We had made too many political compromises on the way. Our study of, in January 13 showed that we were pushing people we were freeing up spaces, and Nelson Nygaard, I thank them for these uh, studies. We were pushing people out of the lots and onto the streets on the eastern end of town, exactly the opposite of what you want to do. But we were freeing up spaces for the restaurant owners. I'm gonna skip through these last slides, but happy to take any questions. We pushed cars out of the lots and onto the streets, not a good thing. But the garages were no longer as filled and we were able to get spaces for the employees. 
We did free up spaces for the restaurateurs. And let me skip ahead to the lessons that we've learned from this. The first is get a key, get a consultant. It's absolutely the key. You're never a profit in your own land. People won't believe you unless you have an outside person there. Have loads and loads of public hearing. Find out what the opposition is. Go to them. Listen to them. Try to meet their concerns. That's what I mean by keeping them out of the room. If you meet their concerns and stop them from going to a city council hearing, you actually have a chance. I put try to charge only charge people from out of town and being a little bit facetious, but every politician's dream, taxation without representation. <laughs> and um, <laughs> the most popular part of our plan was getting the, the uh, commuters off the street. Everybody liked that. Uh, we made mistakes. Don't, don't compromise with intractable foes. I had several people on the council that said a dollar an hour will kill us, some of the merchants. We compromised to 50 cents an hour. They were just as opposed. Don't give away the ship on, um, on pricing. We haven't made enough on this program we need, and now it's very, very difficult politically to, in order to increase it. And finally, tweak the plan all of the time. Uh, that's absolutely critical. Uh, today, as I look at it, we have, what we've been able to do is sell the plan by supplementing the money that we get. We get a little bit of money and pay for parking. We supplement this to put in flowers, plant trees, keep downtown cleaner. A lot, most people think it comes from pay for parking, so we've got a little bit more buy-in than we had before. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Fiorentini, that was great. I think one of the most interesting things about Haverhill is not just the parking challenges today, but the parking challenges as downtown Haverhill changes and grows, which it has been and continues to. Uh, Mark Chase is up next, Sal's up next, great. Sal is up next to talk about uh, parking challenges in Wareham, right down towards the Cape, particularly seasonal challenges. Uh, good afternoon, I guess. Are we, are we at that point or still in the morning? Um, I used to be a basketball coach in my other days, and I used to like to walk up and down the sideline. So I'm going to do that now. Um, the presentation that I have for you is, uh, was originally about an hour or so and is, is being called down to 15 minutes. So this is going to kind of be like speed dating, okay? Uh, for those of you who like the numbers uh, and, and you want to look at that stuff, uh, you can, you, these pre presentations I know are going to be available afterwards. You'll be able to do that in detail. I'm less concerned about that today, the actual numbers. I want to really walk you through our process and talk to you about what I think some of the, the key issues were for us. Um, but just before I begin um, the presentation, I just want to tell you a quick little piece about Wareham. Um, Wareham is at the uh, mouth of the Cape. Uh, it is just before the bridge. And before 495 was built, it was the uh, place to, uh, to go. You had to actually go through it. Um, now that it's not built, um, uh, but now that 495 has been built, um, people bypass Wareham. So we're actually looking uh, to try to make sure that people can come here and see us as a viable alternative to Cape Cod. I will tell you that our population doubles in the summer from 22,000 to 44,000. So we're going to focus on what I think is the key, uh, one of the key assets, which uh, is Onset Beach that whole entire area. So this parking study is built around that Onset Beach and the challenges that come with um, being a community that for uh, you know eight to ten weeks has 44,000 people in it and the rest of the time it's filled with residents, okay? Um, first thing we did here was uh, we, we uh, started with a, a series of uh, public uh, 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 meetings and you know uh, we tried to do three basic things one was just to look at how the uh, parking the existing conditions of, of the parking uh, look at uh, strategies and uh, recommendations and then the development of a plan uh, big thanks go out here to uh, of course to Nelson Nygaard for their help I, I would echo what the uh, what the mayor said about um, making sure that you bring in um, consultants um, 
the, uh, the, the one thing that uh, we, we sort of had some principles that evolved out of the initial meetings, and those were to uh, protect the residential areas. Uh, there were comments about how the town gave parking away free. Um, interestingly, things related to safety, lights, and uh, other safety issues. Um, we have a little post office in downtown. That was a, an area that uh, people had concerns about. Uh, of course, we had boating, so we got trailers, and how do we deal with that? Um, and then uh, there were a lot of folks who felt that we needed a greater uh, 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 enforcement. Um, this chart that you see here, I just really want to highlight for you the three key things. We're, we're talking about pricing parking. And interestingly enough for me, um, people don't park necessarily based on the price. They park based on other factors, uh, safety, availability, convenience. Those are the things that drive uh, people to park. And on this chart, you'll see here that pricing is actually the fourth uh, highest element that people would consider is the price. Um, we, we ask questions about why do you come and use our area? And uh, what you would find here is you see that most people here come uh, to, to, they either live here or they come for the beach. Um, so understanding why people are using the area that they're using and that you're trying to control parking in becomes really important um, in the pricing strategy. Um, we looked at uh, where people were currently parking. One of the things that you'll see here in this chart is that the, the residents, 82% of residents, um, were, uh, were parking on the street here in this area. Um, when it came to non-residents, um, and of course you'd have to look at the whole numbers, but uh, only 54% were parking on the street. Um, so uh, we started to ask uh, some questions. How close do you want to park to your destination? Now, this is something that's fascinated me because um, I, we, we're also looking at another area of our town, which is uh, downtown Wareham, and the entire end, from one end to the other, seven minutes walk. And that's the same thing here. If you go from one end of onset, really, to the other end, it's about a seven or eight minute walk. But people want to park 30 seconds from where they're going. And uh, this was just incredible to me um, and because th it's, it's been one of the sources, the biggest sources of, of uh, uh, opposition to our, to our projects. So what you'll see here is um, in this one, the residents versus the non-residents. Um, and uh, you'll see non-residents end up parking as far as five to nine minutes um, away. And the residents, again, want to park right in front. Um, so <clears throat> we asked people how long does it take to find a parking spot. Residents generally said five minutes, non-residents seven. Maybe the residents get some inside knowledge, I guess, that the non-residents uh, ha don't have. Um, so the, the next question that became obvious was, uh, you know, what do you do if you can't, you know, how long how long's does it take you to find a place? And if you don't find it, you know, what happens? Um, and so people, uh, what we found is that 68% of people failed to find a parking space. So this speaks, obviously, to wayfinding, right? So not only when we start talking about pricing, we got to really inform people of, of how we go forward and, and understand where the best uh, uh, spots happen. Um, so the parking principles that sort of evolved out of this uh, process were to first protect residential parking. And I think this, we've been hearing all morning about the buy-in, how we get people to buy-in. It's protecting the residential uh, parking. Second is the employees. S big issue again, you know, if you're in a retail area with employees not making lots of money, you've got to find ways to help them park. Um, safety. Uh, you know, Wareham, for those of you who know, has had challenges with safety issues uh, in its community. So it became a big issue for people. We want to make sure we can park and we're safe getting in and out of our cars and going back and forth to businesses. Um, we wanted to encourage the beachgoers who are going to stay for a longer period to go into the lots and not take up those spots that are going to rotate um, and increase the availability of the front door parking. Um, there were uh, a number of processes we used. One was an inter uh, intercept survey. So we literally went out and, and grabbed people off the street as they were moving back and forth from their cars. Um, and in, uh, in this one, we started to ask questions about what are you doing when you get here? Uh, on the shorter stays, I think it's 56% uh, uh, for dining. Um, the longer stays were the beaches. Um, and uh, some of the festival activity. We have a number of festivals throughout the summer, and so that's a, a, a big piece. We asked people about how long they parked. Um, what you found here is uh, folks parked for, uh, uh, on street for about two hours was the largest, and off street, uh, three hours or more. So people who are uh, going to stay longer periods of time are more willing to park off street. Um, we asked for preference. 
Um, and of course, when you ask for the preference, people want to park on the street, right? They'd like to park closer to their de uh, destination. Um, and uh, if they're going off street, in this case, they wanted to park uh, on the pier. Now, one of my big challenges that I've had, and I've been barking about this since I got to Wareham, is the most pristine piece of real estate in the town's a pier, right? We use it literally to park cars, okay, in Wareham. And I'm trying to make the case that you need to get the parking off the pier because that's the place we can develop and then we can bring more people to the, down, to, to the downtown and we can create maybe even a year, a year round economy. But that's a huge, it's been a huge challenge for us um, in William getting people to buy into that. Um, we asked people how much they'd be willing to pay if parking was safe and convenient and I found this fascinating. You know, of course you got those people that say nothing, right? Those are the naysayers, 14%, we're not paying anything, all right? We don't care about safe, convenient parking, we're not, we don't want to pay. Then you got folks on the other end that were saying we'd be willing to pay $10 a day to park in a safe, convenient place. So that, that gives you the sort of range, I think, for folks in, in terms of how much they value parking um, going forward. So you see different folks will do it, uh, you know, depending on their need. Um, we, this chart here just tells you that we went out and we looked at neighboring parking. So we benchmarked neighboring parking to see what the rates were and what was going on in, 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 uh, in town, surrounding towns to get a sense of what, what, what made sense for us to use uh, for our parking decisions. Um, all right, so it, this really comes down to supply and demand, right? I'm gonna, I, I really think um, about this sort of demand-driven parking model and I know it's been talked a little bit differently about performance, but this idea of, of demand and how you capture it. Um, so in, in Wareham, this, this picture here is just a, 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 the section of onset, that little green, uh, this little green piece that you see at the bottom is actually the Wareham Pier, that I, the onset pier that I was just talking about. Um, there were over a couple of thousand uh, parking spaces and 90% on the street were unregulated, the ones that are off street. Uh, where 15% were paid by lot and others were just informal parking spaces. These um, charts, I'm not going to go into these charts right here, but, but these are part of the utilization study. So I'm going to show you there's several charts that look like this, the Pierre Shell Point. We looked at a number of areas where we wanted to find out what, what, what the uh, utilization was. Because again, if it's demand driven, we want to know where most people are going. Um, so we looked at, at uh, a number of different places and, and tried to mark that, uh, that out. So you'll see that's what these, uh, all of these charts are the same, uh, in, in, they tell you the same kinds of information but for different locations. Um, so uh, strategies and recommendations, and I think this is uh, really interesting. In the beginning, and, and simultaneously, we started out by bringing kiosks into uh, just as the study was done, it just happened that way that the kiosks were already starting to come in as the study was done. So what you see here was the pier was priced at two fifty and two dollars, and this other lot, the temple lot, was also priced the same way. Um, as we went along, we began to realize it couldn't be priced the same way because nobody was using it. So they dropped the price in the lot up on Temple, and what you saw was we got a greater usage out of it. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned about the kiosks, over this, this past summer, which was the first summer that we had put those in, we managed to, uh, between uh, July 18th and September about $56,000. And that's a little bit higher than what the average had been, which was, I think, around 53. Um, they actually had folks collecting uh, funds at the pier in the past. They used the senior work-off program to do that. So uh, that became quite the challenge. Um, I want to just zip through because I want to, uh, I know I'm running close to the end of my time and I, I want to uh, get to a couple of things at the end that I think are really important. This right here, so where you have problems with supply and demand, the best thing to do is increase the supply, right? So these are just a couple of creative slides that I give uh, Nelson and I got great credit for coming up with these ideas. This is just a lot that was out there. This is what that lot might look, look like if we just changed the striping, okay? Um, this is another example of the lot, and this has a little pocket park in it, which has become a little mini drug haven. So what we said is let's change it, okay, and open that up so that we can have it, better parking up on the lot. This is another one, and this was the most creative one. This is a crazy intersection, and again, we looked at it, changed it, different way to uh, view it to add supply. 
And then this last one, uh, this is uh, Union. This, this would be reverse angle parking coming back in on Union Avenue. You double the parking here from 20 spaces to 40 spaces. So I think it's really important. So the, the last piece of this is just this idea of the parking permits and trying to understand how you can permit so that you can generate revenue. Bottom line here is that we try to generate as much as $180,000 of revenue using the parking permit process, which is not in place now. And with that money, you could then do things like maintenance, dump fee, fees, enforcement, other kinds of things that, that you might, uh, might not have funds for. You can do it if you uh, make these kinds of changes. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do was just end by uh, letting people know that um, the, this area, seven minutes from one end to the other seems like a short amount of time to me, but for lots of people it's not. But I think if you change the pricing and make that pricing uh, more expensive in the areas where people really want to be, then you can get people to use those lots outside, which they would not have done in the past. Um, and again, uh, you can take all of this and uh, then uh, use that for uh, upkeep in, in your areas. And I think this, it, although in our case right now, these funds do go into the general fund. So when I get back to Wareham, I'm going to make sure that I encourage our leadership to put them back into the area because I think that the notion that, uh, that folks will support it more if they know that money's going back into the area is really important. So thank you all. I appreciate uh, the uh, time. Um, Sal, thank you. It was a really good example of uh, how learning about people's behavior and how pricing influences their behavior uh, makes a really big difference. Uh, next is Mark Chase. <laughs> Great to be here, folks. I'm going to take a, a, a higher level approach. I'm, I'm a lecturer at Tufts University. I also consult, so I'll, I'll be talking about some of my projects. I'm also a rabble rouser in Somerville. I'm a resident there and advocate for parking reform there and have done some work with the merchants, and I'll talk about that. Um, I think the most exciting thing about parking is what it can do around the edges, the things that really aren't parking, and, and that's what brought me into the parking world. I realized a lot of the things <laughs> that we want to do in our communities that are really great um, get fought because there is not enough parking. And um, this is just some, some things from my community. We're looking to put in what's called a protected cycle track, which uh, would involve taking away a lane of parking and separating the bicyclists from the traffic. Um, the neighbors obviously weren't too happy about that, and I can't really blame them because uh, their perception was they could not find a parking spot, and the cost of parking is $30 a year in Somerville for a permit. <clears throat> if you go on Craigslist, it's $100 a month um, to purchase a parking permit on Craigslist, not a parking permit, rent a driveway on Craigslist. So if you're a smart Somerville resident, you'll get your parking permit and you'll rent your driveway on Craigslist and make $1,200 a year. So, so these are the kinds of battles that we run into when we're trying to make our communities better places to live and, and they kind of fold into this idea that we have a, a scarcity that's imposed by not charging enough. And um, I'll, I'll get into that because nobody wants to pay more for parking and um, no driver wants to pay more for parking, and at some times we're all driving. Um, we, we recently had a proposal in Boston for car-free development, and the, the developer was all gung-ho about doing that. The neighbors again stood up and said no, and again, um, Boston is, is really amazing. I'll talk about their permits a little later too, but um, some of the most expensive off-street parking in the country, the permits are free. If you're a resident, you can be on Beacon Hill or the Back Bay and get a permit for free when it costs $400 or $500 a month to park in a parking lot. So you can see the, the difference there is great. Um, there's a great TED Talk, and it's about congestion pricing. Um, I, I highly recommend watching that. One of the things the speaker brings up was right after the, the Berlin Wall came down, a planner in East Germany came to London and said, I really want to learn about how you manage your bread supply. It's just amazing to me when I walk into a supermarket and I see all this bread and, and I just don't know how you do it. Like, how do you manage that? 
And of course, to us, we don't think about it. We have people who are making bread, who are responding to market signals, and they make enough bread. And if you want a lower price bread, you buy that. And if you want a higher price bread, you buy that. And for low-income people, we have a program, food stamps and other programs. We may not have enough of them. But it's not like we're saying we don't care that some people can't afford bread. And I think in parking, it's the same way. Some people can't afford parking, but we can account for that. We should still try and have a system that works. Um, and, and I alluded to this, who wants to pay more for parking? Really nobody. But can we p manage parking better? And I think um, earlier we heard <coughs> that one of the goals of the program is not to raise the price of parking. The goal of the program is for you to be able to drive downtown and find a parking space quickly. And that's a different message. And I think we need to frame what we're trying to do in a different way, which is really we're trying to manage our supply better. Uh, one of the things whenever I talk to communities about parking is, well, if we don't manage parking, couldn't we build our way out of it? And these numbers are actually low for Boston. But if you were to build a surface parking lot, um, it's going to cost you at least $10,000 a space. And in cities, that isn't necessarily compatible. It's not a long-term strategy in a city to have your parking be on the surface. Because it, you have to walk too far if you have a lot of people. You will have lots of parking lots, and you won't have a very nice urban environment. So you can build garages, and that's somewhere upwards of 20,000. Our earlier developer said 50,000 in an urban environment. I think that's a high quality garage that's very beautiful to look at. But 50,000 is the number. And if you're going underground, which is this lower right, some of you may recognize this beautiful park, Post Office Square. This, at the time, was $50,000 a space, which people thought was incredibly expensive. But now it's upwards of 100,000. Um, the park is beautiful, and, and seriously, if we could afford to build that parking everywhere, we would have all of our parking underground. And, and so people don't realize how much it costs, $100,000 a space. And once community members realize, well, do I want to raise my taxes and subsidize that parking lot, or do I want to pay the monthly fee, which for a you know, $100,000 space might be something like $600 a month or $500 a month. No, they don't want to pay the fee. They would rather solve the parking problem, which, um, OK, so if we're not going to price, we can, do, we can do something like time limits, which is frustrating because the way you keep make time limits work is you ticket. And any merchant will tell you ticketing will kill your customers. As much as they don't want to pay for parking, ticketing is an, an uglier alternative. Permits are kind of interesting if you didn't issue more permits than you had parking spaces. So Boston has um, a permit parking program. It's free. It's essentially a license to hunt. So if they, if they said something like, we're going to limit our permits to the number of parking spaces, that could work. But then you'd be like, well, who gets the permit and who doesn't? So um, in Somerville, with that cycle track I told you about, I am proposing that when you move into that neighborhood, you cannot get a permit for a year. So that essentially protects all the old timers. They get a permit. The new person who moves in, if you know that area, is going to be a student at MIT or Harvard. Probably won't have a car anyway. And if they know they can't get a permit, they're not going to live there. But there are a ton of students who will be willing to live without a parking space. So immediately, you would free up some supply. Maybe you need to make that two years if you don't free up enough supply. But you could solve it with permit, permits without pricing. And then there's ticketing, which nobody likes. Um, but when you get into permits and time limits, ticketing is a key enforcement tool. So I think pricing is superior to all of those things. And it's very exciting to hear Donald Shoup talk today about that. Um, my eyesight's not very good, so I'm going to move down closer here. Basically, one project I worked on in Davis Square, and this is as a resident, I went and sat down. I, I do consult on parking as a professional, but living in my city, I want my city's parking to work well. There's nothing more frustrating than being a consultant and walking down the street and being like, I wish this was different. So I, I met with the merchants, and the merchants were all in favor of this. In fact, they were very frustrated with tickets. This is in Davis Square in Somerville, uh, very thriving, probably one of the five or six most thriving retail districts in the Boston area. Um, 
they would be very happy if pricing would replace time limits. Many of the merchants, of course, they're not monolithic, but the biggest merchants in Davis Square, like Somerville Theater, Johnny D's, Red Bones, they would rather see pricing used than time limits, and they would really like to see no ticketing and have patrons pay for what they want to use and not come out of the restaurant and find a ticket on their windshield. They're also very concerned about the technology because, as we've heard before, if you're feeding a meter at, with coins and you're paying, right now it's a dollar an hour in Somerville, but let's say we make it two dollars an hour, you want to stay there for two hours, which you may want to even stay longer, that's eight quarters. You start to really, if you want to stay there four hours, that's 16 quarters. You feel like you're at a slot machine. And that's not a good situation. So the technology is really key for the merchants. And so we're ready. We've done a number of parking studies, some professional and some volunteer. Uh, we are looking at going into a public process in Davis Square where the merchants can formally weigh in. And we will move to some of the things that you are seeing here today. So in my experience, there are two ways that you can get this by your community. One is to say, and this is what Salem did and many of the communities that passed this, that managing parking is about demand and not revenue. And this is a credibility problem. Are, you, are, is your, are your voters credible that you're really going to be doing this to manage parking and not to make money? And Salem did effectively do that, and many communities have effectively done that. Um, and to do that, I think you have to have open data. We heard uh, Renus from Salem say, I haven't seen the data. I think the business community would be much more confident about supporting this if they saw, is ticketing revenue going down? They'd, they'd probably be fine with, tic with paying more and seeing meter revenues go up if ticketing revenue is going down. So open data is really uh, critical to that, and Salem worked well. But the second way, which um, I will highlight something Jason highlight, Jason scooped me on this in Nashua, um, parking can pay for what the community wants. And essentially, in this framework, you're saying, what, what, do you, what do we want in this community, and how can we pay for it? And there are many ways to pay for things, and most of them are more unpleasant than paying for parking. And, and Nashua was a good example of that. So using the carrot of what, is the, what are the things we want in our community, and that comes before parking can't be like, I want to raise your parking prices, what do you want? You have to start with, what do you want, and how can we pay for that, and parking can be the solution. Uh, a key thing is the community control, and I think that's always a struggle when you decide to part with parking revenues. Is the city going to decide what this money is spent on, or is it going to be the people who live there? And I think we, uh, many of you may be familiar with participatory budgeting. And uh, this is a new thing where, where communities are putting aside money and letting their residents kind of decide how to spend it, becoming decision makers like the city councilors are or the administrator of the city is the mayor. The residents make all those hard decisions. And having the parking money fund that process is just a very exciting thing, as you will see when you start to look at um, the kind of money that parking can generate which I'll I'll show you in a few slides. So there are lots of parking benefits around the uh, parking benefit districts around the US. They all went through some of the political processes that we saw today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Massachusetts because most of you is anybody here not from Massachusetts? A few of you. Um, even if you're not from Massachusetts, many states have a law that says when you have meter revenues, you have to spend that revenue on things that are related to the meters. So in Massachusetts, it says you, ha you, you have to spend meter revenue on necessary expenses related to parking meters. But it goes on to say you can also spend those revenues on regulation of parking and other traffic activities. Well, what, do, what are other traffic activities? It is in court cases, not in Massachusetts, but in other states. Other activities have been street, street cleaning and snow removal. Well, if you're a municipal leader, if you start to count the cost of street cleaning and snow removal, you're spending way more on your parking system than you are bringing in in parking revenues. So there actually is a lot of room to raise parking rates and not exceed the amount that you're spending to maintain the parking system. Um, 
Recently, in 2012, there was a, a revision, and this was thanks to the town of Acton. They wanted to use their parking money to fund commuter shuttles. And so this legislature revised the law so you can now spend the parking revenue on commuters, shuttles, and transit station accessibility improvements or traffic controls. So these are all explicitly permitted. Um, the bigger issue really is, the, the common practice is just pour all that money in the, the, the general fund. As we all love Donald Shoup's video of the devil underneath the sidewalk. Um, and the cities and towns spend um, far more than they take in. So really, it's a political barrier more than a financial law. There's, there's, no case, there's been no case law. Nobody has been sued in Massachusetts to say you're spending the parking revenue on the wrong thing. If you have community support um, and there is a reasonable nexus, you're probably going to be fine. And um, the, the community support is the key thing. Uh, Jason talked a little bit about Nashua. Um, they wrote a very simple ordinance that said, if we bring in more than $728,000 in meter revenue, anything above that goes back to the business community. But this is all within the general fund. This is not a parking benefit district. It's just written in that money goes into the general fund, and then out of the general fund, we will allocate money. That amounted to a significant amount of money, and the business community is 100%, well, 90% plus behind this program. Very excited about being able to improve the business district. So I'm going to end there, and um, we can take questions and comments. Great. Uh, thanks, Mark, and, and thanks to our panelists. Um, what I think is really interesting about this session called parking pricing is that pricing is a really big component of smart parking management, but just pricing alone doesn't do the job. And, and we talked about the political will and uh, some of the other challenges and difficulties uh, of not just pricing, but managing a parking system very smartly. Um, and as moderator, I think I get to ask the first question, so I will start and then open it up to you. Um, I'm wondering from all of your perspectives, um, particularly um, in Haverhill, uh, smart parking pricing changes based on geography and time of day, and in Wareham based on seasonality and protecting those residential streets, and for Mark, uh, your, your variety of knowledge of, of different communities, what's the one thing that municipalities can do to really change that political will and, and change that, that balance to really make these types of policies a reality? Not sure if this, this does work, good. Uh, I think letting people really know what the options are up front, and, and I've, I found it very successful to say, if we build parking, we can't afford to pay for it, so we can do nothing and, and suffer through this, or we can manage what we have better. And a lot of people are concerned about paying more for parking, but you don't necessarily have to pay more. What you have to do is, either make a revenue neutral or you could lower prices and take a hit. No municipality really wants to do that. But if you create different pricing zones by lowering prices, you will still have the same effect. If you're at a dollar now and you lower your crummy spots, the spots that people are going to have to walk to, to 50 cents an hour, you're going to immediately get the people who are long term walking from those spots. Now You're, you're going to give up some revenue there and that's, that's going to be a difficult thing. That's a, that's a conversation with the community and say, no way are we going to give up revenue. We have to make this work for us because you want the services that our parking gives you. So it's a dialogue. Well, changing the, um, the price of parking is extremely politically difficult. And uh, once we committed to 50 cents an hour, the smart thing at that point was to say, okay, we're going to charge more on the streets, get people off the streets and into the lots. But that was met with an outcry saying you're going to have a 100% increase in charge for parking. You can't do this. And we simply didn't have the votes on the city council. Uh, what we're trying to do now is put together a plan that says we'll give you something if you'll give us something. Revenue is not quite as critical to us, so we'd certainly like to have a little bit of it. But uh, 
getting some more buy-in, getting people off the streets. It's, I don't know the answer. It's, it's very, very tough to do it. It's all I can say. Uh, I, I think I would just add that, that it's about meeting people's needs, right, at the end of the, end of the day in the community. Um, so I've held lots of public uh, meetings. For, I work with the Community Development Block Grant Program. We're required to do that a lot. And this parking, the parking meetings we had had the most people in them of any of the meetings that we held. Um, we had 100 people in, in, in this little uh, a place in Onset to, to come and have the conversation. So I think people get very interested about the things that impact them and trying to help them understand how you can meet their needs and, and benefit them through that process, I think, is how you help to build the, the buy-in. Uh, can I add one thing, too? In some places around the country, and I think Donald Shoup alluded to this, they simply set the table for business leaders and residents to come forward. So in Austin, Texas, they said, if you would like to have a parking benefit district, we've set up a model where you can apply to have one. Didn't say, you know, we want, we want you to do this in this neighborhood. They said, here's a way you can come forward as business leaders and apply for that. And a neighborhood came forward and it's been a great success. So. I think that's a good model, which is set the table so that residents can, can come forward. And when there's money on the table, which is kind of a, a key thing, which is saying you're going to get half this revenue or you're going to get 75% of it, the net new revenue, that excites people and gets them to come forward. Uh, ready for questions from the audience? There has to be some. <laughs> um, Mayor uh, Fiorentini, you mentioned that you had made efforts to uh, do a rezoning for parking, and I was curious whether you or anyone else on the, the panel had done a rezoning or had worked with uh, local property owners on their on their parking because I know it seems like we were talking a lot about municipally owned parking right now but at least in my community in Gloucester there's a lot of downtown parking that's dedicated to office to to shopping centers that um, the utilization is much lower in those in those lots than there than, than this the uh, the uh, city owned lots so I'm just curious whether you can speak to that we had a lot more success with rezoning uh, than we did with pay for parking. Uh, we started in the downtown area. There was uh, actually no parking requirement there at all, which uh, I thought was ideal, but it really isn't because there was a special permit requirement to build any housing. And as a practical matter, that, that meant a lot of uncertainty with developers. Uncertainty is, uh, kills you with any development. And it meant, as a practical matter, that the council was going to put in two parking spaces per unit. So we added some certainty. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to eliminate all uh, zoning parking requirements for downtown mixed use. I couldn't get that through. We were able to get through a number of compromises. One space for a studio or one bedroom apartment, 1.2 spaces for anything above that. And really the key was a series of compromises that said what you counted as a space. Any public lot that was within a thousand feet where we could sell you a permit or lease you space counted. And believe it or not, we got, uh, got away with, nobody objected, it was, everything was transparent, with leasing the same spaces two or three different times we were able to show the city council that we leased the space to this development, we made the development go forward, uh, but people aren't really parking there, we have lots of free space, so we can lease it a second time. And all of that was key to bringing in 550 new units downtown, 850 new residents, and, and it helped. But I have to say what also helped was getting a parking garage downtown. The parking garage and the rezoning went together, they were symbiotic. We got the developers to contribute capital costs to the parking garage and the parking garage to lease them spaces. All of those things work together. I, th I think it's important to recognize too the, that when you're doing zoning, it's often a response to overflow parking. And overflow parking is really, in most cities, a kind of a parking and transportation department, whereas the zoning is a planning department 
and it's been my experience that they kind of don't pay attention to each other at all. And I, I guess the zoning people might grouse, well, you know, we've got overflow parking. But I, I think it's very important to get to the public and be like, one of the reasons why we have such a problem with development is because on-street parking is too cheap, meaning people can't find a space. And it gets back to the politics of, well, you're going to raise, you don't want to raise the price of parking, you want to make parking available to people. And how do you politically do that? But without solving the on-street problem, you'll build the garage in the apartment and the people will park on street because it's more convenient than the garage. They'll only park in the garage when they can't find a spot on street has been the experience in my neighborhood. Mine too. Time for a couple more questions. Hi, I'm Lori Moss. I work for the city of Somerville. Um, and we're, we're um, doing more neighborhood planning than in the, has ever been done in the past and um, looking at overhauling the zoning ordinance. Um, and so, you know, it seems like you know, we, um, Davis Square, we have a lot of data and, you know, people like Mark are working in Somerville and um, we're able to tie zoning with, um, with on-street parking there a little bit better than in some of the smaller squares like Teal Square and Magoon. Um, and it just made me think when we were talking about, you know, altering pricing and things like that, it seems like the technology um, to have meters with uh, credit cards and being able to change prices um, is really needed um, to, in order for this to work properly. And so I was just wondering if, if um, you could talk a little bit about, you know, in um, these smaller squares um, or other places that don't have, have the technology, how, how does it even work? Is it possible um, to have pricing that makes sense and, and reduce um, zoning requirements uh, for parking? Um, I, I, just coming from a small town um, and certainly not have, we just introduced the technology of the kiosks. Um, I think for us it was easy to look at uh, where, where the demand was based on the assets that we had in the area. And so we, we sort of backed into it, I think, in, in, in some sense, because we were able to identify those assets and then the further away from those assets that you were, the, the less you had to pay for parking. This concept that uh, uh, Shoop Dog put, put forth this morning um, with the multiple prices changing all the time, I mean, that's crazy stuff for me. I, I think it's, it's going to change. I think it's going to radically change. I, I think you're right. I think it's going to radically change parking. That it, it's sort of um, just-in-time pricing, if you will. Um, and and that, that, that concept is fascinating to me. So I don't, I, I think it's, it certainly is something that in a, sm versus, you know, when you have different squares of different sizes, it would certainly make some sense to look into that. It's a little bit of an apples and oranges thing with meter prices and zoning because meter prices typically affect more out-of-towners and they're in a business district whereas zoning's in the residential district and it's more am I going to be able to come home at night and park in front of my house and so the meter pricing and the technology wouldn't really help in that case so much I, I do think the beauty of parking meters is they can often charge people from out of town more than the in-towners the in-towners in Somerville always have resident permit parking to kind of rely on um, but in, in Somerville, I think really the nut to crack is the price of the resident permit parking, which is $30 a year, which I think is, is outrageous. And, and politically, that's going to be tricky. And I think it's going to involve returning the revenue from the permits back to neighborhood groups where they can do fantastic things in the neighborhood with that money, get excited about the idea that parking is doing great things in the neighborhood instead of the adversarial relationship that we have right now. So. I'm extremely leery about demand-based pricing where prices change all the time. The uh, number one complaint I get about pay for parking, well, the number one complaint <laughs> is I don't want to pay, but the number two complaint is that it's too confusing. Demand-based pricing, it, it seems to me, I'm certainly not an expert on it, goes the other way. It gets more confusing uh, where you can change prices, where there's different prices at different hours at different times. It's uh, 
I'm, I'm leery about it. I, I'd like to add to that too. I agree with that comment, and I think there are different stages to reform. The first is geography, which is geographically priced differently the best spots from the worst. And then the second stage is time of day. And, and so, so many of us, especially in Somerville and Cambridge and Boston, we haven't gotten past the first step, which is by geography. And once you get geography, that solves 80% of your problem. And then you have the Friday, Saturday night problem or the Red Sox game problem. That, that's, a, that's a temporal problem where you do that next after you've proven how great the geographic pricing works. Uh, one more note about technology and raising prices is that they often do really come hand in hand. People, if, if meters only take coins, people don't often have a problem throwing in a quarter or two, but they don't really have a quarter or two. But if they have a credit card, dipping it in for a dollar or a dollar fifty, no big deal. Even put on a little bit extra so I make sure I don't have a ticket. So raising prices without having smart technology is, is quite challenging and uh, if, if your goal is customer convenience and uh, availability, uh, keeping both of those in check and working with each other is, I think, very, very important. I think we have time for one, time for one more? No? No, we do not. Um, uh, thank you all so much uh, for talking about parking pricing, and we'll, I think we're back here next. Yep, for lunch. Thank you.